What's up, welders? This is part two in the welding trolley series. If you're like me, you built a welding trolley like this, and you can see the main problem here. When I go to grab the MIG gun, I don't know which one it is. Now that everything has been cut and the butt wells have been prepped, it's time to assemble the frame. This is a collaboration with Joko Engineering Help YouTube channel, where he has videos where he goes into how to use FreeCAD to create a parts library for like the angle used in this welding cart project. And his second video is how to assemble the design in the A2 workbench. I will put a card up to his channel now and I'll add his videos to the welding cart playlist. Here's my go-to channel for anything CAD related. I've designed the cart to utilise a popular tool chest off Amazon to keep all your common welding tools and consumables in one place. This will be great for all of the OCD organisers out there. The design allows for it to be used in a few different configurations. You can remove the toolbox from the chest and make room for your welding helmet, spare rolls of wire or a stinger, or leave the toolbox in the chest for a low welder height and plenty of storage, or have the toolbox on top to maximise the storage area. I opted for this option. I screwed the toolbox to the top of the chest and fixed the gas tank upright to the toolbox to secure everything together. When welding the frame like this, a bit of thought into how you weld it will play a big part in the finished product and how it will look. I'm not just talking about which process, but in what order I weld each joint and what direction. I'll give you some explanations on how I approached the project with my 19 years of coded welder experience. I'll be using the Yes Welder 205DS for all of the welding and I'll be using MIG with an Argon CO2 mix. It has a little bit of oxygen. I think the best wire size for a home shop is 030 or 0.8mm. It can be easily used with 22 gauge panel steel for your project car or up to quarter inch or 6 mil plate. If you'd like to purchase the welder I have an affiliate link in the description below. Use my coupon to get 10% off your entire cart value. As mentioned before I prepped the butt welds in the previous videos. All of the miters have a 35 to 40 degree prep on the flats and I've ground the vertical joints to have a square edge instead of the 45. The reason for the inside prep is to keep the weld profile low so the tool chest can sit correctly and because I have prepped the vertical portion of the weld the two angles come together will result in a nice corner weld and a small amount of penetration on the inside so I don't have to weld it. Any excess penetration from the butt weld can easily be ground off so the casters can be fitted. I'll build the frame in two parts. The first is the tool chest base. For smaller items like this, I tack the frame in two parts and then join the two 90 sections. I will tack the top edge and on the inside corner. When you go to tack something, always remember to tack where you can get to it if you need to break the tack in case you've made a mistake. These first tacks are just to get it fitting nice and square. You can always add more tacks to the job to keep it from moving before you weld it. Before we start welding, a brace can be welded to the part to keep it from going out of square. Just do small welds on the same side of the brace. It will make it easier to remove later. I would tack it to the bottom of the frame to hide any grinding marks, so it will be hidden once completed, and it's a lot easier to remove once welded. Don't ever use flat bar as a brace because any stresses will actually just bend the flat bar. The Yes Welder is a synergic machine, so it means you set the gas type wire size and then you set the material thickness. I've just got the machine so I'm still getting used to it so I keep the off cuts and I use that just to get the machine settings dialed in. When you're using different positions you actually have to adjust the welder to suit the position or the different weld configurations. You can see here I had a few practice runs to make sure everything was good. I have the machine set to MIG which stands for Metal Inert Gas Welding so that is argon and CO2. The oxygen content of the bottle is about 3% so it's still considered MIG welding gas. It has been specifically designed for the automotive or light gauge furniture type welding so it's perfect for the home shop. It has a bit more gusto than the 7525 and it runs a lot nicer than straight CO2. 
I have a few posts on weldingempire.com on gas selection for welding. So if you want to go down that rabbit hole, I recommend you checking them out. The vertical down welds need to be one and a half to two volts colder than the butt welds because of the effect that gravity has on the molten steel puddle. When I'm welding it, I have the torch on a sharp angle dragging the weld. So the wire is being forced into the puddle to slow it down by cooling it with the wire and increasing the reinforcement. The reinforcement is the profile of the weld. This is an example of a weld that is too hot from excessive faults. The start of the weld has minimal reinforcement and has eaten away the parent material at the start of the weld. The molten puddle is so hot resulting in the puddle becoming unstable and falling away. If this was a longer weld the problem would only get worse. The weld is not penetrating into the parent material and you can see that the start of the weld is beginning to crack already. To correct this either reduce the voltage and for non-synergic machines you can increase the wire speed. With the ideal weld you can see at the start it hasn't eaten away at the parent material and the weld puddle is stable throughout the whole weld. It's not going in front of the arc at all. So it can be sometimes counterintuitive to get better penetration, the hotter the setting is not always best. This is why I recommend using a piece of scrap metal to set the machine correctly for a weld. Once you have a good setting for that position and material thickness, jot it down in a notebook somewhere and keep it safe so you have a future reference. For the butt welds, I weld from the outside corner in this is to let the heat build up from the weld to be absorbed by the larger amount of material. Not only will the weld look nicer to have the low profile end in the corner, I won't run the risk of the outside edge of the weld falling away from the heat build up. The cold start of the weld in the corner will look unpleasant and reduce its strength. If you've happened to make a mistake and you ended up with a gap, no biggie, you can use a piece of copper to bridge the gap. You can use a piece of copper pipe flattened down, but it's worth having a thicker piece. The steel welding wire doesn't stick to the copper, so it can be removed after the weld. I'm welding from the inside out because of the sparks would have destroyed my camera. And the copper is a good heat sink. Once the frame is cooled down, you can remove the brace. I suggest cutting the weld directly in the center on a 45 to intersect the joint. You don't have to cut all the way through. Now just use an adjustable spanner to break the weld. If you've tacked on both sides, this wouldn't be possible. To clean up the tacks and any excess penetration, I use a flexible grinding disc. They're very good at removing a lot of material and they don't gouge into the parent material if you're accidentally too aggressive. Once 90% of the weld has been removed, I switch over to a 60 grit sanding pad. These will give a nice surface finish ready for painting. You can use these or flap discs for the whole process, but it will take longer and be more expensive. It pays to clean up after each component is done, not after each weld. This is how you improve your efficiency when doing projects. Because of the plans, I know I can weld a few smaller components together before I can assemble them. This will give better results and it's easier to weld. These braces will be for the casters for the gas tank end of the welding cart. To speed up the fabrication of anything, I always try to use a clamp or a guide to line up the items. Throughout the build, I'm using a lot of the angle as a straight edge from the actual welding project itself. If you can, tack similar components together, so when you're in the zone for welding and you have a machine set up, you can blast it out quickly and you'll get good results. When you're welding, try to be as comfortable as possible. This will give you better results because you're more concerned about what's happening with your weld, not how uncomfortable you are. And if you're new to welding as a career, by the end of the day, you're not going to be as tired. Here I'm doing a dry run of the weld to make sure I'm comfortable throughout the entire weld. Now that I have that sorted out, you can see I'm using a little anti-spatter. And when I'm going around a corner, you'll notice how I roll my wrist to change the angle of the MIG gun quickly. This speeds up the welding as opposed to doing two welds, and it's stronger and it'll also look neater. This is a light duty anti-spatter, so it's not going to stop all of the spatter from sticking, but what does stick will be removed easily. The stronger type anti-spatters are very bad for your health, and I would highly recommend using a respirator.
If you don't have any, you can always use cooking spray. It's a bit harder to remove the oil later for the paint prep and you also run the risk of getting in trouble from borrowing the kitchen supplies. To tidy up corner welds, I put in a wire brush into my cordless drill and then I can just get the rest with a wire brush. Now the smaller items have been welded together, it's just a matter of finishing off the gas tank frame. If you've ever tried to square something up that doesn't let you butt the square up against both surfaces, you can use a rule to measure at the base and at the top of the item. If the measurement is the same, it's all good. Once you've finished tacking the item together, just double check it to make sure it hasn't moved. The next two pieces are cut down angle for the base of the tank frame. I left half an inch or 12 millimeters of the leg of the angle to increase the strength so the trolley can handle the 300 cubic foot bottles or a G size. These are the best options if you purge a lot of your pipe or tube when TIG welding. I'm using the gas tank support here to keep everything straight as I tack up. Because of the light duty of the frame and the weld preps, I position the frame into positions that are quick to weld and give good results. To get a flatter profile, you can have the frames on an angle. Being able to position something for a better result for the weld and speed is something you should optimize for. Just think before you go to weld something, is this the most effective way to weld this? If it means you can put it on some trestles so you're more comfortable, or you can spin it around to weld it so you aren't adjusting the welder for all the different settings because of your different positions, it saves a lot of time. You may have noticed in this project after a weld I'll give the weld a quick tack, that's to prevent a large crater in the weld preventing it from cracking later. When I'm welding I'm trying to wrap the weld around the corners and each weld will form a nice union between the next. Now the two components have been welded out, I use the spare angle again to align the two components, tacking it together and adding some extra tacks in before I go to weld it. This next weld is a good example of the welder being set correctly for the position. The pole is nice and stable and it isn't rolling over top of itself or going past the arc. When it comes to the base of the weld, it doesn't have any cold roll and I can weave the horizontal fillet weld to give a nice profile with no undercut or cold lap. The next weld has large tacks either end of the weld. You can simply weld over them, but it won't look as professional as if you cut them out. The frame has been welded on either side, so I can remove them. Strictly speaking, you should always remove your tacks to give the strongest possible weld. The start of each weld is weak from the lack of penetration. Welding over the tack will make the weld even weaker. With the fillet welds being completed on the other side, I've opted to back grind the welds. I'm using a 332nd or 2.4mm thick cutting disc. I first cut a line into the material. This is too narrow for the weld to penetrate, so I will twist the grinder slightly either way, each direction. This will create a wider prep for the weld. I find if I use a grinding disc to do this, it tends to wander and makes a mess of the job. This is a subtle thing here, but this is a welding sequence. I have the job on a 60 degree angle to speed up the job and reduce the spatter but I'm leaning against the job to be comfortable and when I'm welding, I'm welding the furthest weld away and at the top. This prevents the spatter sticking to the weld if I'd weld at the bottom and I'm not leaning against a recently welded joint. This next shot here shows how the welds have tied in, where one of them hasn't. 
This is the 2.4 millimeter or 3 30 second cutting disc that I was mentioned before. And you can use a grinder delicately to feather out the weld. When you're grinding a weld, don't grind the weld flat if you want it to blend to look like the other welds. Try and reproduce the shape of the weld that you want with the grinder. They are actually quite a delicate machine and you can get good results with them if you practice. I find having the handle on them is a hindrance. Now all the welding is finished, I flip it over and drill out the caster holes. It will be easier to do this before the gas tank support is welded to the frame. I am using a thousand pound casters with all four swivelling and braked. This adds to the high speed cornering and hill parking. I position the casters as close to the edge as possible but keeping in mind the thickness of the angle so the bolts still fit. I pile up the holes with 8 inch drill bit. I made the mistake when I was working with a lot of stainless steel to use double ended drills. They grabbed and they damaged my chuck. In saying that, I cannot recommend these Milwaukee drill bits highly enough. They are titanium coated, which is cool, but they also have flat spots to prevent them from slipping in the chuck. As I said before, I worked with a lot of stainless steel, which is a pain, but not with this set. I've had them for close to two years and I use them a lot. The case is very robust and it held well too. I will leave a link in the description for these. They are seriously the best drill bits I've ever used. I like to deburr all the holes. I have a deburring tool, which I'll link to below, but if you don't have one, you can use a larger size drill bit and get a similar result. With the holes drilled, the bottle support can go on. The angle has a flat spot ground on the back, so it'll be hard against the tool chest. I trial fit the tool chest, and I decide to use some leftover flat bar to secure the tool chest to the welding cart. I haven't put any cable supports on the welding cart in this video. I'll be adding them later on. Now the welding and fabrication is done, I use a wire wheel on the grinder to remove any spatter or loose rust. I use wax and grease remover to clean off any dust and anti-spatter residue. The white rag is evidence why you shouldn't skip this step. I opted for a wrinkle finish paint to match the handles on the tool chest. It looks cool, but I think the particular paint I got needed to be baked on. It had a set of rock covers on the can, so it might be designed for high temp applications. This is where the welding budget got thrown out in the R&D department at Welding Empire. The drag coefficient of this welding cart is the same as the school bus going backwards. I hope you liked the build, found the video helpful, and if you've watched it here, I'd appreciate a thumbs up. Thanks guys.